thank you for joining us for today's extension of community healthcare outcome session. Just a recap on last week's session on pediatric dolly takeover that is being that is being rolled out by ZAMSA and the distribution has started with the bigger hospitals. We expect that children over between three and 20 kg will have will now be able to use Dolitegwava as a first line. Um, it is a scored tablet. I'm told it has a strawberry flavor. So that's some good news for our pediatric population. So this is exciting, and this is for children that are more than four weeks. This is for children more than four weeks. Uh, we want to thank everyone once again. I see our panel of experts has joined in, uh, Dr. Mpeta Bobo, Dr. Jonas Hines, Dr. Dien Mwansa. I'm sincerely hoping that Dr. Luad Sivanda, our uh, OBGYN, will join in at some point. As usual, we ask that we all mute our microphones. If possible, we switch on our videos and observe echo etiquette. There will be a Google link sent out for registration by UNDA. Um, just uh, a reminder, today we have two presentations, but they are both not very long, so we should be able to maintain time. Uh, we are getting updates on uh, mask. This is part of PPE in the healthcare setting. We are all aware uh, COVID-19 is an evolving situation. New data is coming up every day. Hence, guidelines are being updated accordingly. We are also going to talk about uh, COVID-19 vaccines for pregnant and breastfeeding women, a very important uh, topic so that we get uh, clarity on this issue. So we'll start with Dr. Hines. Dr. Hines, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy you could join us. Uh, do you want me to share the slide deck or you will do it? I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, so I thought that um, the uh, vaccination one was gonna go first, but that's not happening, I guess. Oh, that's fine. We could start with the vaccination one. Dr. Dien? Dr. Manza, Dr. Bobo, is it okay if I share or you share? You can start. I, I don't mind going. Oh, okay. If, if, if you, yeah, yeah. Just give me yes. one second to get situated. Okay. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah. Can I confirm that you can hear me? 
Yeah. Yes, Dr. Uh, Heinz, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Great, thank you. So thank you to everybody for being available today. I wanted to give a brief update on mask use to help prevent COVID-19. The reason for this presentation is because um, the science on mask use has evolved over the past year, and we wanna ensure that everybody is up to date on the most cutting edge information on how to protect themselves by using masks. So I'll go through a few slides and present some information that will be useful to the audience. So the, the learning objectives for this presentation are to review SARS-CoV-2 transmission and to provide tips for maximizing protection from SARS-CoV-2 using face masks. But before we get started, we'll, we'll start off with a poll question. So the question has some uh, graphics associated with it. It says, which of the following represents correct mask use? A, it shows a picture of a man and then the, in the caption says a surgical mask loosely covering nose, mouth, and chin. B, a cloth mask covering a surgical mask. C, a surgical mask covering another surgical mask. D, a surgical mask covering the, no, uh, the mouth but not nose. E, a surgical mask covering the nose and mouth but not the chin. And F, a KN95 mask covering a surgical mask. So again, the question is, which of the following represents correct mask use? And then there's there's six pictures, um, each with a description under them. It's very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Hines. We'll give this a bit more time than usual because it's it's quite visual. So the question is, when you look at the, I guess you'd call them the modes of masking, which of the following represents correct mask use? Is it A, a surgical mask loosely covering the nose, mouth, and chin, as illustrated in A? Is it B, a cloth mask covering a surgical mask? Is it C, a surgical mask covering another surgical mask, uh, two masks, double masking, I guess. D, a surgical mask covering the mouth, but not nose. E, a surgical mask covering the nose and the mouth, but not the chin. F, a surgical mask being covered by an AK-95. So AK-95 over a surgical mask. This is, this is very interesting because I guess we are all trying to protect ourselves from the variant in many ways. And for sure we've seen all these <laughs> done. The, the only one that's probably there is a surgical mask uh, over the head. We've seen it under the chin everywhere. So which of these is correct? A very interesting voting pattern. Great. Very, very interesting. Should, should I move on? Uh, in a minute. So we are okay. going to end the poll and share the results so that you have an idea. This is how uh, most people voted. So most people actually felt A, a surgical mask loosely covering nose and mouth is correct. B, a cloth mask covering a surgical mask, correct. And the KN95 covering a surgical mask. So these were the top ones. The rest were out. So and to be interesting, please go ahead. Great, thank you, Dr. Sambo. So just real briefly um, to review how SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted. So it, it's a respiratory illness that's caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. And when you get the disease, it's called COVID-19. So the virus SARS-CoV-2 causes the disease COVID-19. And it's transmitted person to person through respiratory particles. Those particles are emitted when we cough, sneeze, or speak. And they can be droplets, which are larger, or they can be airborne, which are smaller. Um, and the difference is that droplet 
droplets tend to fall to the ground quickly and they don't usually go further than two, one to two meters, whereas airborne particles can remain suspended in air and travel further. And then additionally, it can be transmitted through fomite or contact transmission. So a contaminated surface with virus on it can be touched. And then that, uh, if that person touches their face, um, like their eyes or their mouth, then they can, tra they can transmit themselves through, through that mechanism. We know that uh, infection occurs mostly through close contact, which is defined being within um, one to two meters for, for more than several minutes, um, different definitions, but just sort of a loose, loose definition, and also being indoors. Those are the two big risk factors for transmission. Um, and we also know that the virus is, can, uh, be, it can be shed uh, before symptoms begin, um, that shedding, which correlates with when someone's most infectious, um, it peaks around when they have symptoms begin, but also the even asymptomatic shedding can occur. So people can have no symptoms, but still shed, which is one of the really insidious things about this virus is that you can be transmitted without someone even knowing they're sick. So correct mask use um, includes a mask that covers your nose. It also wraps around your chin. It fits snugly to minimize any gaps that may exist. And if you have a nose bridge, which is that piece of metal that can you can shape to your nose, that you use the nose, nose bridge. And so if worn correctly, a face mask both blocks and filters. So it blocks your uh, mouth and nose from part particles landing um, in the area, but also the material that's made out of filters out small uh, particles um, that you may otherwise breathe in. So why does the fit of the mask matter? So as I just uh, alluded to, so you have these respiratory particles that contain SARS-CoV-2 virus, and they can land on your mucous membranes that are in your mouth, your nose, lining your eyelids, and cause infection. Or um, you can inhale the virus into your respiratory tract and get infected. Um, but the reason that the fit matters is that some of these particles, especially those that are airborne, can enter along the sides of the mask. And so you can see that um, demonstrated in the, in the visuals here. You see um, sort of a, a, a cartoon demonstrating how little gaps around the nose, or around the cheeks, um, could allow uh, small particles to enter into the mask. And then there's also a photograph on a mannequin um, showing how you know a, a sort of regular surgical mask on some faces when it's worn sort of balloons out and causes these gaps to form along the cheeks. Um, but if you have a mask that fits well, then the mask is gonna filter better. You're gonna be breathing through the actual material of the mask. And that, that mask has been you know, engineered with three layers um, that are designed to help um, capture particles and prevent you from inhaling them. So the next two slides, I'm gonna review a, a seminal study that came out uh, um, earlier this year regarding mask use in some ways that you can improve mask fit um, so that you can, you can um, um, ma maximize filtration um, of, of a regular mask, okay? So we're gonna talk about two different strategies. One is, a, is, is called double masking, which is, is wearing a cloth mask over a surgical mask. And that's shown by the graphic um, on the left, in the upper, upper graphic on the left, there's a mannequin with a surgical mask on, and then there's a cloth mask over it. And then there's another um, way to do it, which is through um, what's called a knot and tuck. And so that's shown on the right. And there you can see there's like a little knot near where the, um, where the, the strings attached to the mask, and then the excess material is tucked in. And for that, it's a little bit uh, more confusing. I actually have a short video that will demonstrate how to do that in a little bit. So we'll, we'll see how to do that. Um, so everybody gets an opportunity to learn. But the, um, the, this, there was a study done, this study was done where they had these two sort of mannequin heads and they simulated coughing and they simulated breathing and they measured the exposure to particles in both a face that was the sick patient and then a face that was the not sick patient. And they basically measured how these two strategies, the double mask and the knot and tuck mask, how they reduced exposure to particles um, compared to just using a res regular surgical mask. And so the graph there on the uh, bottom right-hand corner shows this, um, that um, you have the light gray bar, which it represents the exposure to particles during coughing, um, if you just have a surgical mask on. 
Then you have the, the blue bar, which represents the uh, exposure to particles during coughing if you have a double mask. And then you have the green bar, which represents the knot and tuck method. And so we can see that um, in this experiment, just wearing a surgical mask, the, um, the, the recipient, the person who was not like the sick head, um, they were still exposed to uh, roughly 40% of particles. Uh, double masking reduced that to 14%, and then using a knot and tuck method uh, reduced it to 23%. So both of these uh, strategies that improve mask fit reduced exposure to respiratory particles um, um, during coffee. So that was a very compelling, uh, compelling finding. But the more compelling finding is actually the reduction in exposure to aerosols during breathing. So not even a forceful uh, uh, expiration of respiratory particles, but just regular breathing. And so here we have two graphs demonstrating the findings from this study. And in the first one, it shows basically um, the reduction in aerosol exposure during breathing. And the, um, the first, the top graph shows basically the situation with universal masking. So if both the sick person and the receiver or yourself in, in this example, we're both doing the, the strategy what the exposure to aerosols would be. So you can see that if both the sick person and yourself are wearing a surgical mask, the exposure to aerosols is relatively low, around 16%. Um, so there's, there's you know, still a lot of protection gained by, by people using surgical masks, but it's enhanced by using double masking or the knot and tuck uh, method. You can see that that exposure to the aerosols is very low um, using those strategies. But then if you look at the lower graph, the one on the right, that's, this is a situation where the sick person is unmasked, but you, you yourself are masked. And so this, I think, is a useful graph because it really demonstrates probably the more realistic situation where you may be coming into contact with sick people in a health facility who may or may not be masked. And you can really see the benefit here of using these strategies that improve mask fit. So just using a surgical mask um, um, when, when the unmasked person was, or, or when the ill person was unmasked, still exposed to 92% of those aerosols. But using a double mask, it's reduced to 17%. Or using the knot and tuck method, it was reduced to 35%. So really a substantial reduction in uh, aerosol exposure using these two strategies to, um, to make a, ma a mask fit better. So I um, hope this is going to play. And if it doesn't, we can uh, make sure. Oh, yep, it's going. OK. So this is a demonstration on how to knot and tuck your mask. Okay, so this uh, link will be shared with the slides if you wanted to watch that again. I know it was quick, but I just wanted to give you a, a visual demonstration rather than explain that with words. So just a few more caveats on mask use. If you're using a cloth mask instead of a surgical mask as protection, you wanna make sure that mask has at least two layers. And again, you wanna make sure it covers your nose and your chin. For respirators, which are N95s, KN95s, and FFP3 masks, these are specialized equipment that filter out over 95% of uh, particles three microns or larger. And typically these are prioritized for healthcare workers like yourself, um, especially those who are performing aerosol ge generating procedures like intubation or CPR. A lot of times we hear distinctions between N95s and KN95s. The distinction is that the former, the N95s, are certified by NIOSH, which is the Occupational Health and Safety Organization in the US. Uh, in theory, KN95 should have the same filtering capacity as an N95, 
Although there have been instances where when they are tested, they don't perform as well. But in general, they should be thought of as equivalent to N95s. Now, the, both K N95s, KN95s, and FFP3 masks are more effective when they're used on their own. So adding additional layers like a mask under or a mask over won't actually improve performance. And there's a, even a chance that it could reduce performance because these masks are meant to fit very tightly on our face and create a perfect seal with our skin. And if you have a mask under that, you may be, you may be violating that, 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 um, that linkage on your face. And so you actually may be reducing its filtering capacity by wearing a mask under your N95 or KN95. Lastly, wearing, it's not, there's not like a limited number of masks you can wear that, that adds benefits. So typically we would say don't wear more than two masks. Wearing three masks doesn't add anything and it actually potentially could worsen things because the thicker it is, the more likely you are gonna breathe through any gaps that may exist. So if you have two surgical masks on, and those surgical masks are meant to work as a single, like it, you know, work um, filtering just by itself. So if you have two on, you may actually, you know, two that are the same shape, but you still have those gaps on the side of your face. You may actually still be breathing through, more through those gaps because you're making it harder to breathe through the filtering capacity of, of the mask. So don't wear two surgical masks. So in summary, uh, masks can help prevent SARS-CoV-2 infection and simple improvements can maximize their performance, including double masking and the knot and tuck method. But we don't recommend double masking with respirators because we don't think it improves performance and it could actually worsen things. So just one last you know, plug, please remember to get vaccinated. Um, not, uh, this is a, probably the best way to protect ourselves. We have to do everything we can to layer benefits, but please do take advantage of the opportunity to get vaccinated. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hines. Should we relaunch the poll? Yes. So after that um, uh, didactic, uh, please let's vote again. Are we able to go to the last picture, Dr. Hines? The, the slide 14, which uh, illustrates what A, B, C, D, E, F is. Okay. Which of the following represent correct mask use? A, thank you. A surgical mask loosely covering the mouth, nose, and chin. B, is it a cloth mask covering a surgical mask? C, e, is it a surgical mask covering another surgical mask? Two surgical masks? Is it D, a surgical mask covering the mouth but not the nose? Is it E, a surgical mask covering the nose and mouth but not the chin? Or is it F, a KN95 mask covering a surgical mask? I think this is very important because we've seen all manner of things. And it's very exciting that people are trying to optimize what we have on the ground. We'll give this a few more minutes. Wow. This is, it's, a, it's a big skew. Uh, a lot of learning has taken place and I let a, a few things like the nip and you do a knot just to make sure that I am not allowing particles from the back. So I think this is exciting and everybody's um, saying thank you. I think this is very important. Um, simple, but uh, things that go a long way. The small things do matter. Um, I have ended the poll and uh, we can have a look at the voting pattern and then Dr. Hines can summarize this. Dr. Hines? Great. Th thank you, Dr. Sambo. Yes, so we saw a significant improvement in the, in the scoring. So in the first one, we saw sort of an even spread between A, B, and um, I think F, but now we're seeing most people are choosing B, which uh, B is the correct answer. So, um, it, um, let's go through each of these very quickly as to why, why and we'll figure out why they're, they're, uh, the other ways are not recommended. So A, it's, it's covering the nose, the mouth, and the chin, 
but it's loose. So you have lots of space that uh, aerosols could potentially enter and, and lead to infection. So that's why A is wrong. Um, B is the correct answer. So we have a cloth mask covering a surgical mask, which is what we refer to as double masking. So that's the correct answer. C is incorrect. It's two surgical masks. So remember, um, if you have two masks, they're, they're shaped the same. You put them over, you, you may be increasing the resistance to breathe through the filter, and you may be you know, forcing more air to actually come in on those sides, al along the sides. So, so wearing two surgical masks is not recommended. D, um, a mask covering the uh, mouth, but not the nose is, is obviously incorrect. So the nose is part of the respiratory tract, which is a target for SARS-CoV-2 virus. So if you're not covering your nose, then you're not fully protecting yourself. So that's, that's, uh, that's wrong. Um, so E is incorrect, even though the mouth and the nose are covered, um, having, having the mask not going around the chin, you're gonna have more, more opportunity for gaps, but especially if you try to speak, your mouth is probably gonna uh, open up and you're, you may actually uh, end up exposing yourself that way. And then lastly, F is um, that last point we were making around the, the, in, the KN95 and 95s, those are respirators. They're meant to fit tightly on your face um, and, and form a seal to prevent any gaps. Um, and so by having that mask under it, you may actually be in, uh, impeding the, that seal around your face. And so you may actually be reducing the filtration capacity of that mask. So that's why that one is incorrect. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present Dr. Sambo and, and the ECHO audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think uh, we'll give ourselves a, a round of applause. People passed because some of that information was actually pretty new. Um, I didn't know I could optimize by my mask by um, tying it, especially if it's loose just on these ends. Um, we do a lot of weird things, but this is very helpful. We've seen a lot of surgical masks under the N95. Uh, but now that, now that we know that <laughs> We need to add uh, a surgical mask and our cloth mask. I'm a fan of cloth masks just because they look nice. Um, so this is good to know. Uh, we will take some comments. Um, a lot of people are saying this is very helpful, simple, but very, very helpful. Dr. Dien was, uh, has something interesting. He says, uh, would it be better if the gentleman was clean shaven? And if you look at your Hollywood windows, which are these <laughs> windows, you may see Dr. Dien was, uh, who is very contrary <laughs> to the comments he's asking himself. Um, anyone who yes. said that the barber shops are closed. <laughs> but yes, Dr. Hines, any comment? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think the recommendation from, from um, experts is, you know, that having a beard potentially also, uh, you know, leads to extra sort of, you know, hair material that could lead to gaps. So, especially if you're using a, uh, N95 mask, it's recommended to be clean shaven. Um, but I think even in the case of double masking, it's probably a recommendation. So sorry, sorry, Dr. Monza. <laughs> so he agrees with that. So thank you very much. I don't know if we have any questions uh, before we go to the next presentation. I see we have a lot of people joining us. We have Dr. Bright in Sokolo, Vice President of the Zambia College of Physicians. Um, very knowledgeable man. Thank you for joining. I have one uh, concern about breathability <laughs> because we are barely breathing in these things. Uh, did they assess breathability in the mask, Dr. Hines? Yeah, I mean, not not in this that specific study because they were using you know these uh, robots to like sensors. There have been studies that have looked at breathability, and, and that certainly is you know sub sort of subjective dyspnea from you know too thick of masks is, is a concern. Uh, like if you're wearing too many masks. Um, I, I mean, I think that it, it somewhat depends upon what a person's comfort level is. I, I can say that, you know, um, since I read this study, I've been double masking and I haven't noticed a, an issue with, with, um, with breathing. But I would say that if you are somebody who, if you put that a cloth mask over the surgical mask and you feel like it's in, impeding your breathing, well, then maybe the not and tuck method is a better choice for you because in that instance, it's just a single mask instead of two. Thank you so much. So we can double mask, but that is only surgical mask below the cloth mask. Please, I think very important, especially for us who work in the COVID world, we love, love, love to do this because it makes us feel more protected where you add an N95, especially at the bottom of your, where you add the surgical mask 
under your N95, you are actually compromising the integrity of the N95 and you may actually be increasing the risk. Let's avoid double masking with two surgical uh, masks. Of course, three is a no-no, <laughs> you're gonna die with the mask. But no, this is very helpful. We are going to share the link to come with the slides on how you can actually uh, close the gaps around the mask. Extremely helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hines. I'm sure he'll be around to answer any questions in case there are any in the chat. Um, there's another one. Oh, there's two questions in the chat box, Dr. Hines. I don't know if you've gotten them. Sure, yeah, I see. Uh, so what is your comment on people using the face shield without face masks? And then the second one is how long should one stay while double masking? So the first question is, um, it's, it's not recommended P, uh, PPE to only use a face shield and no, and no mask. Um, it, it hasn't been well studied, but I think that it, it goes, you know, just sort of with a common sense that you may be protecting your face from sort of direct landing of, of a drop that someone, you know, coughing right in your face, that face shield may protect you, but there's, you know, air doesn't only move in a, in a straight linear uh, fashion. It moves, it's, it flows like water. And so you're still really exposing yourself to lots of respiratory particles by only having a face shield on. So that's, that is not recommended PPE for, uh, for protection from, from COVID or other respiratory illnesses. And then the question, uh, how long should one stay while double masking? I, I'm, the way I'm interpreting that question is, you know, how long should you remain double masked? And I think that the, the answer is as long as you're potentially at risk for being exposed to people who may have SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, if you're um, on the wards, um, I would recommend, you know, keeping the double mask on. You know, if you go, uh, go outside and get in your car, you can take it off. But I don't think that the recommendation is any different than just using a regular mask. And then there's another question that says, what about people that only use cloth face masks that are well fitted? So, um, you know, cloth masks really came into use during um, the height of the, you know, of, of COVID because of just the global shortage of face masks. Luckily, some of that has been alleviated through increased production. Um, but, you know, there, there is evidence that using a cloth face masks helps. The, the, the challenge is, is that the evidence is very mixed because not all cloth mas face masks are made the same. They're made out of different material. They're made with different amounts, uh, different layers. And so it's really difficult to get high quality evidence on say just cloth face masks as a, as a, as a category. Um, so in general, the recommendation is picking up a, a cloth face mask that has at least two layers, ideally more like three layers, um, but also certain types of material like the cotton polypropylene hybrid and also um, what's called tea cloth. Um, those are sort of the materials that are better um, and some materials are not as good, but the, the literature gets, it gets dense very quickly in terms of like which types to recommend. But, um, you know, going about town, going grocery shopping, I think a cloth face mask is, is fine. Being on the wards, seeing patients with COVID, um, definitely you want to have a surgical mask on at the very least. Um, and ideally you'd have a double mask. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hein. I'm pleased to say that um, joining Dr. Dien Mwansa is Dr. Iwad. Dr. Iwad Zvanda is um, an Obzangaini consultant at Levy. He's seen a lot of pregnant and postpartum women with COVID. So I almost consider him like a clinical expert in that. So thank you for joining us. And I've seen Dr. Bobom Peter. And of course, we have Dr. Mwansa. Uh, literally the busiest man in the Ministry of Health at the moment, we all want our vaccine. He will be um, uh, updating us on the MOH guidelines on pregnant and breastfeeding women. Uh, Dr. Dien, you're welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Sambo. Greetings to everybody on the call. Okay. Do you want us to share the deck or, or you will share it? Um, I think you can share it from that end. Okay, let me do that. This topic is particularly important to us in the hub. We were pretty confused about the breastfeeding women. So I was talking to one of our IT ladies and said, I only got one because I had to win off the baby. So mm. we are very excited to hear this. I've asked the team from UTH to also join in because when I visited them, I said, I'm bringing you four pregnant women. And they were like, don't bring them here. We we don't know what to do with them if something happens. So uh, we, we are very eager 
to hear this, Dr. Jim. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for bringing on board um, uh, the, the, the others to, to kind of help. Dr. Bobo is here, she'll help. Dr. Svanda is here to help. What, what, what a privilege to be um, uh, flanked or supported by those. Um, let me know when I have to proceed, uh, Dr. Ford. Please, it is yours now. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you very much once again. Um, a few slides on the topic as, um, as, as highlighted. I'm working with the Minister of Health headquarters as um, introduced, um, working with the team that looks at the vaccination program in Zambia, including the COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide, please. So this slide is important to me. I, I, uh, uh, some of you have seen it several times. I have to start from here all the time because I think I'll fail in my duties if I do not remind people that um, that landmark decision on 24th of March in cabinet approved a basket of vaccines. So that's why I've always put a basket since then so that people are reminded. When we say COVID-19 vaccine for all intents and purposes, and I think beyond this discussion, I'm referring to the basket of vaccines. Um, and it could be easier to think of AstraZeneca, given that that's a pretty much the vaccine we've had in abundance in the country. But um, just bear that in mind. I'm talking about all the vaccines that are in the basket. Next slide. So for this discussion, I pretty much will attempt to answer these four objectives. The first one is to um, go through an outline of what the recommendations are for the pregnant women and the breastfeeding women in Zambia. Then briefly discuss uh, the timings for people either with current or prior COVID-19 infection, what the guidelines say. And then move on to um, explain a bit. And I think um, there are a lot more people probably come, come to my rescue. Should I get stuck here on the testing and retesting related to um, people getting the COVID-19 vaccination, and then finally elaborate a bit more on the adverse events for immunization, and then what the implications are uh, for the COVID-19 doses. So basically those are the four uh, objectives that I have. Could have summarized them in four slides, but I think we have just about double that number and we should be um, home to discuss. Next slide. So this slide um, tells us the story of what we had on the 11th of July. Today is 19th, about eight days ago, uh, we had this number of pregnant women already vaccinated. Central had six, 10 in Copper Belt, 11 Eastern, were plus 17, Lusaka had the highest number with um, 54. In Muchinga, 44 women had already received the COVID-19 vaccine, 19 in Northern, Northwestern, 25, 22 Southern, and Western had the lowest with three. A total of um, 211, eight days ago, were vaccinated. I have to begin from this point. Figo, um, uh, on, I mean, an institution which I think Dr. Swanda is best placed to speak about, and I believe he'll make reference to it in subsequent um, uh, discussions as we go on, uh, did, um, and, and, I, and I read their um, uh, discussions, but they did conclude that therefore, based on a lot of things that they had uh, considered, they do not consider that there are any risks. Those risks, either being actual or theoretical, that would outweigh the potential benefits of vaccination for pregnant women. We, that is uh, FIGO, um, support offering COVID-19 vaccination to pregnant women and breastfeeding women. And this, this was, I think, in March this year. Mm -hmm. FIGO, I believe, stands for the International Federation of Gynecologists and Obstetricians. I could be wrong. Now, this is yesterday. Um, so as of um, yesterday, we have from 211, eight days ago, we have 500 women that have received um, the COVID-19 vaccines. And I think they are spread like that. I have to emphasize again what Figo said, but let me quickly just mention that 
we still have Western province with the least number. Remember, they were at three, as of yesterday, just five. Lusaka had moved from 94 to 54, so from 54 to 199, Muchinga from 44 to 59. The rest of the provinces are as reflected on the screen. Next slide. So in other words, what we are basically saying is that pregnant women are getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, okay. That scared me. I saw a blank slide. <clears throat> so um, what, what, does, what do the guidelines say? But before that, let me quickly just run you through that most of these decisions that the MOH does adopt uh, on immunization uh, come from an independent body called the Zambia Immunization Technical Advisory Group. Um, just for your information, this body is headed by <clears throat> a consultant pediatrician. Um, that's Dr. Mwene Chanya. I'm uncertain whether he's on the call or not. And it has prominent members, in, including uh, Professor Mpabarwani, Professor Romachirengi, and uh, we have sociologists in there. We have uh, demographers in that group. So it's a group of 13 people that look at all aspects of the vaccine. So the ZITAG did look at several data that exist and recognize the following. One, a lot more exists in the report, but this is just um, a, a slide on the salient uh, features that were mentioned, that the COVID-19 vaccines are not teratogenic in animal models. So I think this is arising from them looking at quite a lot of data related to the preclinical trials um, that, that were done. Secondly, is that the COVID-19 vaccine can be given at any gestation time. Thirdly, that the COVID-19 vaccine does not cross the placenta, but the resulting antibodies are being detected in, um, in, 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 the, in the baby, a newly born baby having um, antibodies as a result of the vaccination. If a pregnant mother tests positive for COVID-19, <clears throat> what they did not, what they did not rather is that um, if that COVID-19 gets severe, if she did not receive the vaccine, she's more likely to have a miscarriage or even a preterm baby. And I think even in this country, we've had such reports. Lastly, they did recognize that there was no risk factor to breastfeeding a baby if a mother has gotten the COVID-19 um, vaccine, like stated above, because it is unlikely that the COVID-19 vaccine will be transmitted um, through milk. Based on these um, um, discussions and a lot more, like I did mention in the report, the recommendation was overwhelming from that 13 member group that uh, pregnant mothers should get COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Sombo, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that um, uh, the, the slide on pregnant women probably, I don't know why it's blank in, in, in the, I think it's the one that we skipped. I don't know if you could go back because the next slide. Yeah, the, this, this, so your slide on breast, breastfeeding, I don't know why it's, why it's blank in your, in your slides, this one. It should have information here. Can you see Excellent. that now? I can see that, yes. Um, so on breastfeeding, on breastfeeding women, <clears throat> um, these again, the salient features that came from that discussion from the ZITAG. Firstly, they did note that there was no risk factor for adverse events following immunization in the breastfeeding child as a result of the mother getting the vaccine. Remember that there is still a chance the mother could experience IFEs or the adverse events for the immunization, but there's no such a risk fa factor in the child. And I think the subsequent bullets kind of um, strengthens that. The second is that um, at least the vaccines that we are using, they are non-live vaccines. And so none of them is expected to appreciably being excreted into um, the, the breast milk. Because we know that no live vaccine has ever been reported to cause infant adverse events because of um, breastfeeding. Also, there is no evidence that the SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted by human breast milk. And I think it's on the basis of that, that even before we had vaccines that WHO did recommend that mothers continue breastfeeding. The final point on that is that a child's immunization, the scheduled immunizations 
should not be postponed because the mother has gotten the COVID-19 vaccine. Again, based on those, um, the MOH did adopt the widely um, considered recommendation that breastfeeding should continue in a mother who has gotten a COVID-19 vaccine. In fact, breastfeeding mothers are encouraged to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. So um, a number of, I think the previous slide, yes. A number of questions have been asked around the timing related to uh, the COVID-19 infection. So let's begin with a person who tests positive. So a person who tests positive today and they have symptoms, fever, headache, and everything else that come with COVID-19, uh, don't think about even vaccinating those. I don't even expect them to be on the queue, so do not vaccinate. But a person who tests positive today and is asymptomatic, those have to be vaccinated. How about people who are coming from surgery, um, ICU, or it could be a survivor? Um, so those require to be vaccinated as long as they are asymptomatic. I have to mention, however, that clinicians here are the ones to clear the client and the periods may vary. We are very well aware of um, what the guidelines have been for other countries. We've seen some countries that say two weeks, others say seven days. We've also seen 30 days from a person who is coming from surgery and, and ICU. What matters is that the person is asymptomatic. And I have to indicate here that the symptoms that I'm referring to in this slide are not limited to those caused by COVID-19. It could be a person with malaria and a fever of 39, such a person don't give the vaccine. It could be a person from ICU and they still have some symptoms of concern, those we don't um, uh, give the vaccines. It is only a person who is recovered post-surgery or otherwise who is asymptomatic that ought to get the vaccine. How about a person who tests positive in between the two doses? As long as they are asymptomatic. So you can see the pattern here. As long as they are symptomatic, they have to get the second dose of um, the COVID-19 vaccine. Again, just to emphasize, it may not be up to the client to say, I think I feel fine. No, the clinicians will tell them actually upon discharge or review that they are okay. Now they can get um, the COVID-19 vaccine. We again insist we do not have a time frame that is prescribed. And um, unfortunately, I think one of the widely circulated infographics that I've seen does not even have official emblems from India. Discussions with colleagues from that end have totally different guidelines from that widely circulated um, infographic that we've seen. So for the purposes of um, um, the program in Zambia, as long as someone is asymptomatic between the two doses, and in this circumstance, particularly those who are admitted clinicians have to say, you can I go and get uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. There are people who traveled out of the country, may have gotten vaccinated for those one out of the country. Uh, for those, um, if asymptomatic, A, and B, if what they got out of the country is the same vaccine that we have, if that happened today, most likely we are talking about the AstraZeneca vaccine. But if that happens after next week, after next week, we are likely to have at least four vaccines in the basket. So it could be any of the Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and um, um, Sinopharm, so plus the AstraZeneca. So if they got it from outside the country and we have it, they are symptomatic, let them get the, um, the COVID-19 vaccine. But if somebody comes today, they got Pfizer from outside the country. We do not have Pfizer presently. The guidance is that they have to wait until such a time that we have Pfizer, which is why uh, people are being reminded that they complete their schedules before traveling. Because when they come here and we don't have a Pfizer, uh, we will not uh, provide them with um, an alternative. I know that there are discussions that I think are ongoing in the vaccines world about mixing and matching. And some countries have gone in that direction. Um, it is a discussion we've had extensively and the guidance ultimately has been that we cannot go in that direction at the moment. Next slide. Yes, um, so um, 
this is important. Uh, probably three questions here have to be answered. Let me take out of the way some of um, um, the, the common things. Should people test for COVID-19 before vaccination? That's a direct no. We do not ask that uh, people queue up on one, on one uh, testing platform before they get the vaccine. There is no need. Remember in the slides that have come from before, um, we've emphasized symptoms. So symptoms are all we go for. We've also seen uh, in some facilities, and I think probably Dr. Bobo could also reinforce because she's, she's spoken to this passionately before, that uh, people are being test, I mean, checked for BP before they are given the vaccine. No, please don't. So there's a reason why I brought in this tweet, because this tweet, like the infographic I referred to earlier, uh, went everywhere. I don't know how many times I received this tweet, so I, I, I put it here. There are two things I have to say about this, this tweet, and I, and I think it's because it's already in the public domain, that's why I had to put it here. Two things I have to say, because A, we saw particularly in the capital that increasing the most facilities would consider BP machine an important tool to have at a vaccination site. Meanwhile, our guidelines say you don't have to do that. So in this tweet, uh, Madam Miti um, highlights a colleague who was, I think, turned away because their BP was elevated. Um, should this person have volunteered information that their BP was elevated? Um, uh, definitely, the, 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 the attending were in line to say, no, they could not give the vaccine. Unfortunately, this led to, I think, what I was referring to, where now it became kind of, an, you know, I don't know where the guidance came from, but many facilities that would visit, they would insist when they ask someone, are you hypertensive? Yes, I'm hypertensive. Go there, they take your BP before we give you um, the vaccine. Um, in some circumstances that delayed the queues and so on and so forth. There's no such a guide, guideline that you have to check BP, even if the person is um, hypertensive. As long as they are asymptomatic, they have to get the vaccine. The second point I wanted to make on this tweet is that um, this tweet started um, trending, so to speak, at a time, in fact, within hours of me having interacted with some health workers from a particular vaccination center, who said we have a client, I think the male was about 54, and um, they said he's uh, hypertensive and he tells us that in the morning, the BP was 210 over one skist, should we give him the vaccine? And he's saying he's got a slight headache. Well, headache, symptoms. And of course, being in the knowledge of the fact that the BP was high, um, we did agree that we don't give such a person the, um, the vaccine. Now, here is the point I'm delivering here. We don't send people away just like that. We have to send them through the health facility. Um, and I'm, I'm quite certain the person I'm speaking to is not this person Madam Mitty referred to. Um, that person also died the following day. That person was brought in dead the following day. Um, the reason I, I have to emphasize this is that if a person had received the vaccine, to the community, it would have been the vaccine. The sad part is that despite being counseled to go through a health facility, the person went home, that they are being hypertensive for quite some time. So I think the message here is this, don't test for COVID-19 before giving the vaccine. And it is not in our guidelines that every hypertensive has to be checked for BP. Next slide. And I think the last area I have to comment on is the IFEs. If you could do a slide back, a slide back, a slide behind, a slide behind again. Behind, back, back, back. Can somebody go behind? They are going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, now I can see it. So I wanted, instead of listing, oh no, I can't see. You yeah, thank, you. <clears throat> thank, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, instead of listing what IFEs are, I just wanted to reinforce that headache is an IFE, fever is an IFE, 
pain and swelling at the site of injection. These also are adverse events following immunization. But please note that fever, headache could also come from uh, malaria. They could also come from the case that I just discussed, um, hypertension. But yours is not really to um, apportion the cause of that. For as long as a person has gotten a vaccine and they experience fever, even if they have tested for malaria, um, as, as uh, it's called you know, in, in, in the community, malaria plus, 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 doesn't matter. Uh, they have fever, they got a vaccine, so it's, it's an IFT. Um, so after how long can we you know, look out for these? We work with 30 days, but we also understand that it can, be, it, can, it can even be longer. And that is why we do emphasize on reporting. Any, and, uh, any event that, that is experienced after getting the vaccine has to be reported. So if headache, fever, pain, swelling, and all these things are IFEs, how do we define an IFE? If you go to the next slide now. So the standard definition is that an IFE is an untoward medical event. Woo! Untoward medical occurrence that happens following immunization. I have to qualify that it does not necessarily have to have a causal relationship with the vaccine. I keep giving an example of me walking into a village where the preoccupation for most men is uh, tilling the land and fishing. And I do a vaccination in that particular week. And in that particular week, we have 10 reports of men falling from the tree, no, from trees rather, um, unless that is common in that village, but that notwithstanding, it's um, an event of interest to us any untold event that, 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 that occurs after an immunization is an IFE, and we request that all of them are reported. These may not be, for instance, a symptom that um, is unfavorable to what we understand about the vaccine or something that a person complains of. The last point is important. It might be a finding from the lab, or it might be a sign from a physical examination. As long as it is abnormal and somebody got the vaccine, all those must be reported. Next slide. So um, in, in conclusion, a few things that we keep emphasizing that must not be done. We call them absolute contraindication to giving subsequent doses. A person who experiences an anaphylactic reaction with the first dose, or a person who has you know, a symptomatic COVID-19 infection or a person who is unwell regardless of the cause. These three categories are people we have to emphasize and we keep emphasizing that they should not be given um, the vaccine. Thank you very much, Dr. Foloshi and team. Thank you so much, Dr. Dien. You have no idea how much your presentation was much anticipated by all of us. Uh, at this point, we will go ahead and get some comments. Uh, is it, uh, can we have someone unmute Kunda? Uh, that was very helpful, Dr. Dien. Uh, there is someone uh, from Simui Muyangwe. Is the vaccine safe for someone who is taking warfarin? Five milligrams. Is the vaccine safe for somebody who's taking offering five milli, mi, milligrams? And then um, uh, I'll let you answer that one. Then now, please go ahead and answer that one. Yeah, I was I was actually going to ask whether you'd probably go through a couple of them, then I comment on Excellent. them and answer one at a time. Okay. That's perfect. So yeah. is the vaccine safe for somebody that has uh, taken warfarin, who's on warfarin? Um, Adamson, are you able to unmute your microphone? Adamson, Jovu. But sometimes it's better when I don't keep talking. Uh, oh, yes, okay, yes, then, I can. Yes, Adamson, please go ahead. Yeah, so mine was on the, uh, there are some case studies that have been reported elsewhere that uh, patients with type two diabetes may 
have a transient increase in the blood glucose following COVID-19 vaccine administration. So I wanted to know if uh, there are any thoughts in that regard in terms of messaging and how we should approach that from our end. And uh, anecdotally as well, I have a few uh, patients I know of who are type 2 diabetes and then after getting the first dose, I think we've had a bit of some issues trying to control their, their blood glucose levels. So I wanted to note on that end what we can do to kind of like um, address such. Thanks. Thank you so much, Adamson. Cecilia Kaonga, may you please unmute and ask a question? Cecilia Kaonga, you able to unmute? So Cecilia is asking, what about people who are elderly above 85 years with hypertension? Should we give them vaccine? And then maybe a fourth one, are all the COVID-19 vaccines on the market safe in pregnant and breastfeeding women, or is it just some of them? Uh, Dr. Zico, Dr. Bobo, I see you. Maybe let me let um, the team answer that, then I'll, I'll get back to you. Dr. Dan, are you okay with answering those? Yes, um, and, and thank you very much for, for, those, for those questions. Um, so the first one related to somebody on, on warfaring, I probably would add, um, there was a question yesterday on, of somebody who is on um, rituximab. I believe that should be one of these drugs used for things like MS and things like that. Yes, as long as they are asymptomatic. And remember the symptoms are not for COVID-19, it's for anything. So a person who has a headache regardless of cause, person with fever, it doesn't matter what people are on, any person is eligible to get the COVID-19 um, vaccines, including those who are on warfaring, rituximab and, and hypertensives, they are eligible to get the COVID-19 vaccines. The other question I picked was a transient increase in um, sugar levels. Yes, that is something that has been reported, in, in, not, in, not in all who are diabetic, and the uh, best explanation I've come across is that this happens in diabetics with any stressor, any event that, that stresses them. So getting a shot, getting a jab is one of them. Um, and there is no link related to the fact that, well, the vaccine goes to the pancreas and so on and so forth. Um, nothing of such sort has have been found, but more related to the fact that that injection is a stressor to, to the body. Number four is people above 85 who are hypertensive, as long as, again, they are symptomatic. As long as they are symptomatic, let them get. In fact, the elderly, hypertensives, and diabetics have been at the highest risk of COVID-19. They are in the broad category of what WHO recommends that they should be prioritized together with the health worker, so they should get um, the COVID-19 vaccines. Are all COVID-19 vaccines safe or is just the ones that, that, that we are using? I might not speak for those that we have not yet started using, but for those that we are using, yes, the conclusion has been um, the same, that they are safe and they can be used in pregnancy as well as in breastfeeding women. Things might change as we have more and more um, of the vaccines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dien. Uh, one of the pearls that Dr. Dien mentioned, especially when I see when people are asking on things like warfarin, rutuximab, which is a monoclonal antibody, uh, the best thing you can do for those patients is you can refer them to their primary physician to check, do they have an active clot? Why was the warfarin prescribed? Uh, uh, have they just had a cavernous sinus thrombosis? That matters. So as Dr. Dien says, in general, as long as we haven't said it's a contraindication, it's not. But you, if you do have a concern, please refer them back to the, if it's a hematologist who sees, because they'll have the, the bigger picture on this. So we can't really give blanket statements on things like blood thinners. We have to know why the patient is on a blood thinner. So I think that's a pro that I really, really appreciated, Dr. Dien. Uh, Dr. Zico, please go ahead. 
So Dr. Zico is one of our favorite ID docs. Please go ahead, Dr. Zico. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I was unable to un unmute myself. Uh, Dr. Dien, thank you for the lovely presentation and the good insights. Uh, I just want a comment on the issue of um, not vaccinating the symptomatics with COVID-19. Um, you also mentioned that if one has COVID-19, but asymptomatic, then they can get the vaccine. Um, I, I would like to believe that anyone who is COVID positive is uh, potentially, it has potential of developing symptoms in the next couple of days. Uh, so there is an issue of um, you unable to distinguish whether the symptoms are due to the vaccine or due to the COVID-19. I would like your, your comment on that. Okay, so thanks, Dr. Zico. Um, I'm sure Dr. Bobo is a comment, so I'll take her just after this. So on the symptomatic, people who are asymptomatic, I think is Dr. Zico's question, should you really be vaccinating these people? I believe the caveat to that one is that they should complete the isolation uh, because we don't want them coming to fa uh, facilities. Um, uh, Dr. Dien Muyunda Muyangwa is asking, can the vaccine be given to a 19-year-old? I guess maybe something from your basket for 16-year-olds, uh, people that are less than 18 years old. Do you have something in your basket for them? Uh, or somebody asked about Kayafi, but somebody told them what it was. Okay, I think for now, can you... And then Prudence Kaika is saying, is the vaccine safe for children under five years old? So in your basket, Dr. Dien, do you have something for our under fives? Do you have something for the people that are under 16? And then we can answer Dr. Zico's concern, which is valid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Forrest. I could begin with the last one. I'm actually unaware of um, a, a country with uh, vaccines for under fives. Um, in, in our basket, we don't have. I, I believe there is no country that has COVID-19 vaccines for under fives. Um, for the under 16 at the moment, we actually do not have. Um, vaccines for those who are under 16, but I'm aware that in some countries they are giving up to 12 year olds. In our basket, we do not have those. A 19 year old is above 17. Remember the vaccines that we have, it's 18 and above, so that person uh, should be able to get the vaccine. Now, speaking to um, um, Dr. Zico's question on the symptomatics and asymptomatics, you are 100% right, Doc, that. A person could be asymptomatic today and they test positive, but um, over the next few days, they could then develop symptoms and uh, move in either, in either direction. So the reason symptomatics are not given vaccines, um, uh, others argue it's not a scientific reason, but it's, it's always a reason that people agree upon. It is because it is extremely hard to tell extremely hard to tell if a person comes up with a fever headache, if it is the headache coming from the vaccine or whatever caused the headache or fever prior to. And, and that's why I spent a bit of time on that tweet, submitting that um, second point to take note of. The person is symptomatic. If that person had gotten the vaccine, I think the conclusion within um, their family, community, and friends would have been is the vaccine. The only reason we don't give symptomatics, regardless of the cause, is because it's difficult to tell if it's a vaccine or not. And so many instances have been reported where damage has been done to an intervention as good as a vaccine because the vaccine is given to symptomatics. And we know a person who is symptomatic, who is sick, they either recover or they don't. There are only two options. They recover or they don't. But if they don't recover, um, how, do you, how do you tell? The easiest thing people run to is what happened in the, in the last few hours. What did they get? It's the vaccine. So that's the only reason why we don't. Nothing um, around cytokines and at cell level and things like that is purely that, that it's very difficult to tell uh, the difference. Now, um, 
um, a person who is asymptomatic today with potential that they could probably be symptomatic tomorrow. The reason you still go ahead and give them. By the way, this is not to encourage people who are symptomatic and in quarantine at home to leave home and come and queue up. No, no, no. And, and thanks for bringing up uh, that Dr. Foloshi. This is for a person who is um, um, within, for instance, um, reach of a vaccination center. And this is quite rare that somebody will be in a vaccination center and also um, uh, testing. Um, uh, so for such a person, they get the vaccine, but there's this understanding that the headaches and fevers, myalgias and arthralgias often don't last longer than 10 hours in which period then um, there's some level of comfort that if someone experiences that two, four, five hours after getting the vaccine, most likely it is the vaccine. Um, we know that yes, people can move from being okay and suddenly they, they drop um, uh, symptoms to COVID-19. Um, that is well understood and appreciated, but uh, it remains a guideline that they still can um, get. The, the beauty is that I think those are, are quite few because often people get the result and they go to uh, quarantine. But if they are in a place, so for instance, somebody is on the queue, uh, two, three slots before they get the vaccine, they get the result that they, are, they have COVID-19. If they are symptomatic, let them get the vaccine. Over. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope that's okay, Dr. Zico. I'll let Dr. Mpeta, uh, Dr. Bobo, um, please go ahead before we, there's a lot of uh, good questions here. I, I, I really appreciate Dr. Bobo. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mansa. Um, I think uh, you've actually touched on a lot of uh, issues. I just wanted to add a few more. Um, on the issue of um, positive, uh, somebody who is positive and uh, asymptomatic and if they can get uh, vaccinated, I think Dr. Mansa has actually explained. And um, I think basically what we're trying to say is that um, if uh, testing, if uh, being COVID positive was a contraindication, then we're going to insist on everyone testing before they get vaccinated. But as it is, I believe most of us have gotten the vaccine uh, even uh, maybe we, we may have actually been COVID positive, only that we didn't know we're actually infected. So that is one of the reasons. But uh, we, we appreciate what uh, you are trying to, to come to. Then the other thing that I wanted to actually add is that I've seen something on um, um, why are you giving, I think, uh, the vaccine to, I mean, is there a vaccine for 18 years? Uh, and somebody actually said below 18 years. Um, I think one of the things is that every time we're talking about vaccines, we usually say 18 above 18 years. I think that is what comes out, but it's supposed to be 18 years and above. So the vaccines that we have, like what Dr. Mansa said, are basically for 18 years and above. But of course, we know that uh, Pfizer, for example, is being given to children at uh, 12 years and above as well. And um, uh, we are going to receive Pfizer in Zambia very soon. Are we going to do it? No, the reason, the reason is that, uh, remember we are getting these uh, vaccines from uh, a pool uh, from the goodwill, uh, goodwill of others, I mean, of uh, wealthy wishers. And um, right, uh, generally speaking, although we've seen children getting COVID-19, they are not as um, susceptible to severe infections as adults. So looking at um, uh, the limited vaccines that we have, a lot of people think it is still not in order to start going lower and lower if you can't even give those who actually need the vaccine. So those are some of the, the discussions that are around that. I also wanted to add to the fact that um, one of the contraindications I know for the vaccine is um, those being treated with uh, monoclonal antibodies. And um, this is very, uh, this is uh, obvious because um, they actually have a potential of interfering with the body's you know, uh, immune response mechanism. And WHO gives about 90 days in between so that somebody has to wait for 90 days before they actually um, can get vaccinated. And then I think uh, Dr. Mansa said, I'm passionate about BP and, uh, and, and, uh, and vaccination. I think to me, the reason is simple. If somebody is um, hypertensive, even if uh, they are on treatment, most of the times when you check their BP, it's still going to be above normal. They actually said if you stop working, just since I've taken already like, it's still going to be above normal. 
and um, mm. like what Dr. Masa said, these are the people who actually uh, get, um, are predisposed to having severe disease. So we actually tend to, they are supposed to get the vaccine anyway. So um, unless they are symptomatic and those are uh, uh, the uh, arguments that he, he brought on, on board. I think I'll end here for now, thank you. Dr. Bobo, you have really, really put it very well and zeroed in, especially on the asymptomatic COVID, especially that we had the highest number of people being vaccinated when we had so much community spread. So maybe that did happen, but that's very clear. I will ask for something. If somebody can also start typing in answers, we are overwhelmed by the response. But what we can do is uh, I would request Dr. Bobo, Dr. Dr. Mwanza, if you can do some um, frequently asked questions, you can see that people are still asking on things you talked about, like uh, Liama, please go with your question. Then after Liama, we'll have Sophia and then uh, Namwinga, Namwinga Ndulo. So Liama, please go with your question. I think it's very important. I see it keeps coming up. Hello, good afternoon. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm actually Liyama, not Liyama. Yes, I just wanted to find out uh, on uh, people who are epileptic. Okay, this is a patient, a person who is epileptic, whether he's on uh, epileptic drugs or not, can they still be vaccinated? And then the other question also in the book, in, in the comment box, which I've asked is about um, somebody who was COVID positive, um, got treatment, and then recovered, tested negative. Um, and it, like you've tested today, the person is negative. When can they be um, vaccinated? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Linyama. Uh, Dr. Msiska? I think Dr. Msiska was asking if you got your Oxford AstraZeneca in February 2021. Is it okay if you can mix and match with some J and J? <laughs> Thing that it kind of protects you against the variant. So she's asking, can such a patient be a person be allowed to mix and match? Namwinga, do you want to go with your question? I think her question had something to do with Pfizer. Hello. And, yes, Dr. Ndulo. Um, so I had a question about, uh, uh, it, was, it was an example that I was giving. If a patient received uh, Pfizer, say four months ago, ended up not getting it um, the second dose because they got sick with COVID and then moved here. Are they allowed to get another vaccine or do they start again from scratch? Okay, that's another mix and match question. Um, I think they'll answer that one. There's one more there. Please ask this question just because this is all about that question. I know they talked about it, but please go ahead, Monde, and ask your question so that we are clear everyone has had the guideline. Monde. So Monde, Monde is asking, how safe is the vaccine in pregnant and breastfeeding women? Does the vaccine pass through milk? Uh, and somebody is asking effects on ART, can people on ART? Can a patient with meningitis or cerebral malaria receive any of the vaccine? And Dr. Dian, as you answer these questions, you can tell, tell us about the, the new, the temperature for Pfizer. I know it has, it has cooled down a bit, it was super cold. Uh, you can tell us about that one as well. Please go ahead, Dr. Dian, Dr. Peter. Um, so I can start then, Dr. Bobo can, <clears throat> can come through to, um, um, at the icing, as, as it were. E epileptics, <clears throat> so generally, the, the rule of thumb is, is the person unwell. And like I mentioned, the reason for not giving unwell people is really not scientific, so, so to speak. Because we know a person who is unwell, the outcomes are always two. They might recover or might not recover. If they recover, well and good. But what happens if they don't recover? So if a person is epileptic, it doesn't matter what drugs they are on, they should get the vaccine for as long as they are asymptomatic. No fever, no headache, none of those things, they should get the vaccine. Negative, when should they get the vaccine? Again, the test 
for COVID-19, uh, be it PCR, rapid test, and its result, they have no bearing on the decision. The decision on whether someone should get a vaccine or not is determined by, did they get a vaccine before? Did they have an anaphylactic reaction? Or are they symptomatic for anything? So the test could be positive, negative, positive, negative. Don't, don't get confused in the positive, negative, and, or is it negative, positive, then again, negative, it doesn't matter. Is the person symptomatic or asymptomatic? And on this, I have to emphasize um, what, what again, um, Dr. Folo, she emphasized. Even those that have recovered, remember we put a caveat there, the clinician has a say because they understand the uh, risk factors associated with, with the person. So it's not a patient to wake up one day and say, I feel fine. Yes, you are not complaining of anything, but you were admitted, you were unwell. So has the clinician said you are okay now and things can't tilt? So in other ways, generally, whether the test was positive, negative, or what, um, that has not no bearing. You could have had, you could be a, a, a person with chronic illness, cancer, HIV, and I think I'm speaking to the HIV question. And on treatment for these, are you symptomatic? Are you a brain cancer person with severe headache? You probably might not even be on the queue for vaccines. Don't get the vaccine. And the reason is the same, because the outcome for all illnesses are the same and it's very difficult to attribute if a person you know succumbs to their disease or it could be uh, the vaccine the question on someone who gets astrazeneca then could they get johnson and johnson i have to say that this is one of the areas that i think is attracting quite a lot of discussion in the science world here is what we know a we know that for instance, in Europe, just about every country you can think of, when they were faced with the decision, um, Germany, Spain, France, when they were faced with the decision when AstraZeneca could not supply them adequate vaccines, and they didn't have AstraZeneca to give the second dose, they all decided to use the available vaccines for a second dose. With the Spanish emphasizing that it didn't matter which vaccine as long as someone got the second dose. The, the Germans were very specific. They recommended that people get mRNA vaccines. The same in Canada, they recommended mRNA after getting um, um, uh, uh, the AstraZeneca. And some got Johnson & Johnson in, in Canada. But in the USA, they have been very clear. Look at CDC, FDA, and their SEIP, which has not yet decide, um, decided on this, but the FDA and CDC have been very clear that uh, COVID-19 vaccines should not be mixed. So that is what we know about the science. And, that, and of course, there is accompanying science to that. But for us, the decision uh, was made administratively. So it's an administrative decision, uh, given that it would be quite complex to handle at the moment. And the guidance that we have been given is that subject to further review later on at the moment, do not mix and match. Which I think leads me to answering this question on somebody who got Pfizer, probably unwell when they were supposed to get the second dose and then they moved here, can they you know, be re restarted? Um, so if that person started with, with Pfizer, the guidance that we have been given is that they would have to wait. I hope soon there's, there's guidance because the question that immediately comes is how long are they going to wait? What if it takes two months for that Pfizer to come in Zambia and so on and so forth? So the guidance, um, make it simple, is that they would have to wait. The question on breastfeeding, um, the simple answer is, is a yes. And I think we did um, mention that uh, A, no risk factors have been found associated with a child whose mother has gotten the COVID-19 vaccine. I also did mention that the vaccines that we are using are not live vaccines, like a measles vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. They're not live. So live vaccines, um, they have never been reported to cause adverse events following immunization through breastfeeding. And there is no evidence that um, those uh, actually move through breast milk. In fact, even the disease, the virus itself, there's no evidence that it moves through breast milk, which was the basis for WHO encouraging 
both the mother who has COVID-19 and the person who has received COVID-19 vaccine uh, to get the COVID-19, I mean, to continue breastfeeding. So a simple answer to your question is that, yes, breastfeeding, mothers should get COVID-19 vaccines and they have to continue uh, breastfeeding. I think I've attended to everything. Oh, the temperature, Dr. Frosch asked about the temp temperature. When these mRNA vaccines were made, um, I think the temp temperature requirement was minus 70. As many on the call might know, we do not have those uh, in the immunization program, um, not in the country. In the country, we have them. TGRC has quite a number of them, for instance, but we don't have them in the, for the immunization program. So we could not opt to get any uh, Pfizer. Those requirements have since been reviewed um, after several studies related to the stability of the vaccine. So the vaccine can actually be kept at minus 20 for a month and uh, can be kept between two to eight degrees for another month. We have facilities for minus 20 and we also have facilities for minus um, uh, two to eight degrees. So as we get these vaccines, uh, part of what we are spending time on is planning so that the vaccine does not come, then it sits in the fridge for a month. Like you've noted, vaccines come today within 48 hours, we, uh, we do the rest of the due diligence and we start giving them. So that is the basis on which decisions have changed that we can get the Pfizer because we'll be able to keep it at minus 20 for 30 days. And once we distribute them to the health facilities, they can keep them for another 30 days between two to eight degrees. Thank you, Dr. Bob, over to you now. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mansa. Um, I'll start with um, one of the questions. When, uh, when you defer the, um, the second vaccine due to any other uh, any reason, when do you give it uh, next? So the answer to that, according to WHO, you give it at the earliest possible time. So uh, you, you give, um, according to the Zambian guidelines at the moment, you actually give the same vaccine. And that brings me to the issue of uh, AstraZeneca first dose, and you want to give J&J second dose. The answer right now is no. And one of the reasons is that J&J, remember, is a single dose vaccine. AstraZeneca is a uh, two dose. And uh, you don't want to, even if uh, you're mixing, I think so far I haven't come across um, any mixing with J&J because J&J is a single dose. Um, I think it's supposed to be like that way. So um, right now in Zambia, it's AZ, AZ, uh, Pfizer, Pfizer, like Dr. Master said. Then the issue of epilepsy and uh, vaccine. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Mansa did uh, talk about it. And of course, you don't want to give it when somebody's fitting for obvious reasons. Um, there, there's somebody, I think somebody talked about a booster. So again, in some countries, they are, they are beginning to talk about um, giving a booster because they've actually covered um, most of their priority um, population. In Zambia, we are still very far. And uh, like I said earlier, we are, we are basically um, getting the vaccine through well wishes as well as, uh, you know, and uh, the vaccine is actually subsidized. So we don't have that luxury yet. So for now, we're just talking about uh, two doses. I think those are the, some of the things that yeah. I got. Okay. Very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Bobo, for emphasizing that. Yes, there are many guidelines in the world, but we need to remember that we have our own context and um, our own uh, policy. So Bryson, I see you've got two questions. Do you want to ask them? Bryson? And I see Dr. Mansa's uh, answer, the mRNA have no effect on our DNA because they are happening in two different parts of our bodies. Our, the mRNA, once it goes and starts inducing an immune response, that's happening in the cytoplasm. In the nucleus, that's where you have your your DNA, so it should not change your, your DNA. Um, there is a question on variants. Is the vaccine effective against variants? And Bryson is also asking, what, what do these same vaccines contain anyway? Do you want to take that up? And Dr. Hines, I think there's one that I think would be a good fit for you where they're asking what population, what percentage should we aim to vaccinate as a country in general from a public health point of view? Dr. Mwansa? 
Um, I, th I think it's, it's the question of what, what uh, uh, I think there are two questions, one on the variants and what va vaccines do contain. Um, so let me begin with the, with the former. Uh, at the time, for instance, the mRNA vaccines were being trialed, we did not have variants. And so you might have noticed some hesitation whenever that question was asked for people to comment on the um, efficaciousness related with mRNA vaccines and the variants. In the last um, few weeks, a week or two, I think we have uh, quite data which is, you know, uh, building up indicating that they are still very, very protective. Um, and, and they have efficacies ranging between 65 and 78% against including the, the, the Delta. Um, this morning I was seeing one um, uh, paper that was indicating, for instance, Johnson & Johnson at 88% and the, the two Moderna and, and Pfizer were at 86% against the, the, the Delta. So basically data building up that they are still very, very protective against the, the Delta. But what has to be emphasized is each time we speak of efficacy, and particularly those that are interested in reading these papers, you, you have to complete reading and read efficacy. What, what is the primary endpoint? Is it infection, severe disease, hospitalization, or death? So when people say efficacy, or oh, Pfizer is 94.5% um, uh, efficacious, Moderna 95, probably I've swapped the two numbers, but around there for those two, what does it exactly mean? Um, so that, that is important because when, when the language of 100% efficacious is used in those trials, what it basically means is that a person who got any of these vaccines, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, not a single person died. So a person who got those in so many of these trials that have been done, and these trials involved a lot of people. For instance, the Pfizer involved 45,000 people, 36,000 people for AstraZeneca. Not a single person who got the vaccine died. That's what it basically means. But some people got the disease. So it, it's not 100% efficacious against getting the disease, but 100% efficacious against disease, uh, severe disease and hospitalization. So that, that, that should be um, un understood. I think the same applies to the AstraZeneca that, that, that we are using, depending on which paper you are reading and source, the numbers still range from the same 65 to about 78% efficaciousness against the variants that, that we actually have. The last point on this I wanted to mention is that whilst the mRNA vaccines were done before variants came, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca were done. For the three quarters of the period over which trials were done involved um, uh, the, the initial vari variants that we had, alpha, uh, beta. Uh, but with the coming of the Delta, people still had to withdraw and get a fresh information. So a simple answer is, is a yes. The second question on what vaccines do contain quite a number of things. The active agent itself, um, which is the vaccine, um, sits on different platforms. In the case of the Moderna Pfizer, that's why we're talking about the mRNA. In the case of Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Sputnik V, we are talking about um, a vector, which is um, basically, a, a, let me call it a friendly virus on which um, the, the active ingredient, the part of the, the, the virus is sitting, or the, 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 the gene for the virus is sitting in that, in that adenovirus. So the virus that is used as a vector for carrying the vaccine is the adenovirus. But in addition, um, the adenovirus is not sitting on its own. There is the fluid in which it's sitting. There are adjuvants that um, are, are added. Often these are proteins that um, help with uh, accentuating the immune, immune response. In fact, in most circumstances responsible for that much acclaimed um, a better response from a vaccine than uh, infection because of the presence of uh, adjuvants. And this is important because it affects how we care for vaccines and how we understand some of the adverse events following um, immunization. Some of them um, might be caused by the uh, other components in the vaccine other than the uh, active agent itself. Over. Dr. Bobo.
Um, Dr. Mansa, I think you've actually uh, touched on uh, uh, almost everything. I just wanted to answer. I was actually typing. I wanted to respond to some of the questions that I see in the chat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, is, um, I think that somebody's asking about the types of vaccines that we have in Zambia. Right now, for the pub, uh, in the public sector, we are using AstraZeneca, and uh, we have a sign of farm that, uh, for Chinese nationals resident in Zambia. This came from the Chinese government. And very soon, uh, we are, we're going to have a um, sign of farm that we're going to give to the general public, that is uh, Zambians as well. And um, I think uh, this week, we're also expecting J&J. &J. And uh, soon, like Dr. Masa said, we're going to have uh, um, mm -hmm. Pfizer as well. I think those are the two that I saw. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Dr. Bobo and uh, Dr. Dien. I want to just say special thanks to Nisa and uh, Davis. They are doing quite a good job of answering all those questions that we have in our chat because we've run out of time. But I think we do have a, a million dollar question here. Um, and the question is how much of the population should we vaccinate to be comfortable? And I think that's a very good question for us to close on. How much have we vaccinated and what's our target? What percentage should we say we've vaccinated and we can be proud and say, okay, maybe we can we can sit back and relax. As you've known, the, some of these variants are behaving like COVID-19 on steroids. So we are all eager to get vaccinated. So what percentage should we get vaccinated? And that can help us close this. Uh, Dr. Mwansa. Yes, um, th thank you very much. So to that question, allow me, Chairperson, to say three things. One is that um, I'm sure the person asking has seen different numbers, and that's why they are asking. Um, that number is often dependent on the population. You have to remember that the concept of herd immunity is, I think, um, in the recent past that it has been popularized, particularly with polio vaccines in humans. It's not a concept with humans. We are not heads anyway. Uh, heads are with, 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 with animals. And, and so the question is really, what is the threshold for herd immunity? So the first point, remember, this varies depending on um, the, the, the region, location, population. And two, is that understand that it's not really a, a, a human biology concept, it's a veterinary concept because animals move in herds. And so we, as a country, do not have our own number. We are going with, the, with, with what, what Africa CDC has guided, that um, all African countries have to aim for anything between 60 and 70%, which is why in our document, the national COVID-19 vaccination deployment strategy, you will find 66.7% in there. Um, there was some minimum you know, uh, modeling done to arrive at that number, but we were comfortable because it arrived at that range of 60 to 70%, which Africa CDC has, has actually guided us. But I still insist that you'll have to understand that number in the context of the fact that it can't be the same. So you might not pull up a number from the USA and say in the USA, they said this. So in the UK, they said this. In South Africa, they said this. And secondly, is that um, the concept of heads, we are not heads. You know how we live. And so it has to be understood in that context. So Dr. Foloshi, between 60 and 70, for us, 6.7%. Over. OK, I think that's a brilliant answer. And it's very, very clear. It's very clear that the vaccine team in Zambia is the A team. Thank you so much for that, for your time. We have overrun by 12 minutes. And I'm sure people will need you back. Next week, we are going to be talking about sexual and reproductive health issues. Once again, thank you to the vaccine team, Dr. Mpeta, uh, Dr. Dien Mwansa, uh, Dr. Reward, and special thanks to Dr. Jonas Hines on those tips on masks. Small things go a, a long way. They say that the five, observe the five golden rules of which masking is one of them. But now we say the six golden rules. 
get your vaccine. As you can see, Dr. Mwansa has a lot in his basket. There's something for everyone. So thank you so much and we'll see you next Monday. Thank you to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.